All right, welcome to everyone who's jumped on tonight. We greet you in Jesus' name one more time. Uh, we're on our 21 days of change, so we're still in a chain fast and chain prayer. We thank God for everybody who's participating in those watches um, and for the faithfulness of the believers. It's been a real blessing so far. And we have been receiving testimonies, and I'm sure more testimonies <coughs> get rolled in. Um, what the Lord's placed on my heart tonight is, as we are talking about and praying towards 21 days of change, establishing new routines in our life, in our families, um, and in our homes, I want us to just kind of revisit some principles for spiritual stability. Some of them we would have covered um, maybe on the kingdom principles, but we're going to go into some of them more deeply tonight, just about three, if we get the time to go through them. And one of the things and we really want you to do is to really go away with practical help. In the previous weeks, we've talked about setting up a schedule. Um, you know, godly living doesn't happen by accident and excellence doesn't happen by accident. Um, not in the natural and not in the spiritual. Excellence is something that the believer has to work at. The Bible says in, I think, Hebrews that we should uh, perfect holiness in the fear of God. Nothing gets perfected without effort and nothing gets perfected without deliberate action. And so we were encouraging couples, partners, married people, single people, single mothers, you know, to just set up a schedule that you're gonna try to live to in these 21 days. Um, and hopefully when the 21 days are over, that schedule will be able to stick. I don't have the details of everybody's work and effort. I'm not here sitting on everybody's uh, in everybody's marriage and, and interviewing couples and finding out what's going on. But I'm trusting that you're going to do what's good for you. Some folks have come back to me voluntarily and have begun to testify of the efforts that they've been making, the difference it's been having. Um, and we want you, if you haven't started yet, it's never too late to start. Sit down with your partners, write up a schedule that you can run your home with. And as I've said previously, if you only hit it 90% of the time, it's far better than not having a plan and praying whenever you feel like you should. You know, if you practice not praying and if you have an environment and a home that doesn't regularly pray, um, it's not easy just to start prayer. You don't realize that you're not in that situation by chance. There are spirits that have resisted you. There are forces that have impeded your relationship. Um, there, there, are, there are enemies that are monitoring your life. And every time you come away from a church service with good intentions or a good Bible study, um, there's an enemy looking to rob you. There's an enemy looking to cause you to trip up. And so we want to encourage you to be deliberate and to be tenacious. So there's three principles tonight that we're going to touch. Um, I hope that we can get through them all. If we don't, I'm, I'm, I trust the Lord will let us just do what's needed tonight. That's how we've prayed. So some principles to revisit from a high level. Um, the first one is accountability. And I'm looking here at the beauty and necessity of the church community. It's a study in itself, um, but I'm going to look at there the partnership and agreement required in marriage, which we've already just briefly touched on. And then for ministry. And when I use the word ministry there, I want to use it in its broadest sense in that we are all part of the work of the ministry. We don't have to be ordained as anything. And I'm going to show you tonight how important your role is no matter where you sit in the body of Christ, you are part of the ministry. Um, the second thing we want to look at is our diligence in business and not just um, natural business. It can apply to that, but in the business of God, um, it was uh, Jesus that said, I, I didn't, you know, I'm supposed to be about my father's business. So we want to talk a little bit about how we take an excellent approach to the business of the Lord. And then the third thing, would be around perseverance through the stress testing of your faith and the stress testing of the things that you put up, you know, your new schedules. How, how do they stand when the timetable shifts? How do they stand after you've just had a disagreement with your spouse? You know, how can it survive those things? And so we want to look at that um, a little bit tonight. And if you summarize um, what these forces or what these principles are against, and what they're trying to combat. Number one, the accountability is an attempt to combat um, individualism. So accountability is anti-individualism. That means, and I need to spend some time on this, that means 
I've not just made an agreement with myself about what I'm going to do over the next 21 days or what's left of it in the next seven days. I'm coming into an agreement with a partner. You might be married, you might not be, even if you're not married, um, that there's power in your accountability when you confide in somebody that here is the plan that I am going to try to live to and work towards. Now, coming into a group helps you. It increases your chances of being able to complete those things. Um, I've, I've done quite a bit of work in, in the business world, and they have strategies and theories about how things get done. For example, when it comes to setting up your business, um, they say that when you write down your plans and what you intend to do, you increase your chances of completing those plans and meeting those um, requirements by 50% just because you wrote them down. Then it says if you put a plan in place to revisit that plan, say every week or every two weeks and you keep to that, then you increase your chances by nearly 80%. And so some of us go through life only wishing that things go well but we don't make ourselves accountable to a plan. We don't make ourselves accountable to other people. One of the reasons why I do prayer and fasting groups is because the group mentality helps us. You know, when you know that somebody else is praying with you and meeting you at a certain time to pray and they're depending on you and you're in a chain and you know you have to hand the baton over. And I'd say, if I'm going to assess what we've done this time, I've not been very forceful in finding out who's doing what days. But I don't like to put the pressure down too much because you know i'm not officially your pastor i'm here just trying to encourage you in the right direction but if you were accountable if you were to say to me brother joseph you know i'm going to do every friday and saturday or i'm going to take the first three days of the week now you've let that out your mouth you know now you you feel like you got to be accountable to me and if you don't do it now you've got to tell me that's something that you're not going to be doing those sorts of things help you to get through and to do um, the will of God in your life. When you, when you come into accountability, there is a very individualistic spirit um, that, that comes <clears throat> upon people. And also it's a, there's a, it's a proud spirit and it also attracts these high-minded spirit. Okay, you must understand that the spirit realm operates, you know, the, the spirits don't walk around on their own. They have friends. Remember in that example where um, the demon is cast out and seven spirits more wicked um, come back to come in that person's life. Um, spirits hang out with each other. So, so where you have an individualistic spirit, you have, you have pride. Paul says that, you know, I think in Romans 12 verse 3, you know, I'm telling you by the grace given to me that you shouldn't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. And, and as sometimes as preachers, we're guilty of making people think like this because we will read the story of David and we'll make everybody feel like they're David in the story. And the reality is, is that very few of us are actually a David in a story. You know, David's a king. He has a lots of responsibilities. He has lots of people under him. He's a man of war. He's the one that everyone's looking to. I mean, we can take some, you know, inference from his life by the way he was called and the things he did privately that he got victory publicly for but sometimes we are egotistical and we're always putting ourselves at the center of the narrative and rather than thinking of ourselves as a servant of the king we make ourselves the king we're just high-minded we read all of paul and and rather than superimpose ourselves into one of his helpers and one of his supporters we are paul and it's just ego it's the way we are as human beings. And so um, we, we've got to really guard against this individualistic spirit that comes Amen. to really divide the body of Christ. Because if everybody thinks that they're the leader and you know, then you're not gonna have anybody who's, who's a laborer and a fellow laborer and a coworker. And so part of what I'm gonna do tonight is actually dig into um, the ecosystem of Paul's life as far as brethren are concerned and look at all of the support that he had and all the, the honorable mentions that he made of people throughout the scriptures or, or throughout his missionary journeys who were there for him. And then we can begin to understand, you know what, maybe, maybe I'm not going to have the highest seat in my church and maybe I'm not going to be the head of the table and I won't be the chair of the committee, but there is such great beauty and necessity for that community of the church to be vibrant and alive that, that somebody can take pleasure in being the person that cleans the building. 
and it's it's not a problem for them to do that it's a joy you know as i've said on this many times one of the first things i did was join the cleaning team as a young person before i was even a teenager i was on the cleaning team and it was it was amazing and beautiful to see saints going around the church singing and cleaning you know in the toilets but they're singing you know doing all the the the, the, the jobs that perhaps nobody else would really want to do but they're doing it with joy I thought I just went to clean. But when the cleaning was over, these cleaners were laying hands on all the seats before they left, pleading the blood, praying for sinners to be saved that would come in the next day, who would sit in these seats, whoever sits on these seats. Anybody seen those prayers? Lord, let whoever sit on these seats get a life transforming experience when they come in the house of God. Well, I learned something more about prayer from the cleaning team. So we need folks that have a joy about doing anything that relates to God's kingdom and advancing it and stop trying to see ourselves as being the number one guy. And I've got to be the, the person at the top, you know, the amount of strife in church over just choirs and getting people to, to, to sing a harmony rather than sing the tune. You know, you, <laughs> you want to, you want to sing in the choir, but be doing all the ad libs that the, le the lead is supposed to be doing. You, you're not the lead singer today. Sing your harmony. You know, do what you're supposed to do. This is, you know, when, when Pentecost, it said that they were all on one accord. You know, the, the, the truth of that statement is really not about them all making the same sound. It's about the chord. It's about everybody striking a different note that resonates, that makes something sound beautiful, like an orchestra. So even though we've got 20 different instruments, nobody's playing out of tune and nobody's trying to play their own tune in the middle. Nobody's trying to do their own solo in the middle of what is a community event. And so we need to be, be guarding against this individualistic spirit. It's a spirit that comes straight from Satan because it's prideful spirit. It makes me think more highly of myself than I ought to. And in a marriage situation, if you have an individualistic spirit, then it's a recipe for disaster because it's, it's my will, my way or the highway. And, and marriage is quite clearly a, a partnership. And so if we bring an individualistic spirit into a relationship, we're going to keep coming up against conflicts. OK, so I begin to, to, to touch on accountability already and I'm going to go back a bit deeper for diligence in business. And I won't talk about it deeply is just to say that we are. It's, it's as anti lukewarm to be diligent in your business is to be anti lukewarm. Lukewarm means being mediocre. It's not hot and it's not cold. You meet the Christian brother, he's not on fire for God. Um, he, he doesn't want to, you know, he's, he's, he's sweetly saved, but don't ask him to come out early for prayer and don't ask him to stay up late for prayer. He's, he's just going to try and do things right down the middle. I'll turn up when pastor says to turn up and if he puts a bit of pressure on, I may even come prepared with an exhortation. You know, he needs to be pushed in prime. When you're diligent in business, you don't need people to tell you what to do. You kind of know already what you're supposed to be doing and you look for the opportunity to do what God's given you. So being diligent is anti lukewarm and then persevering is really anti quitting. So we, we, we have a lot of people who quit on God. They quit on church. They quit on their department. They resign, resign, resign. The minute they hit with conflict, you know, regardless of the fact that when they went into that office, they were so pumped up. They knew that God had opened this door, but the minute somebody disagreed with them, they're running away with their tail between their legs because they can't deal with a little bit of opposition. And so perseverance is anti-quitting. What are we against? We're, we're against individualism. We're against being lukewarm. And we're against quitting. If you are individualistic, lukewarm, or a quitter, you will not be able to sustain any routine that is against the grain of this world and, and against the grain of your flesh. Your flesh doesn't want to pray. It's not going to vote the fast. That's not, that's not the role of your flesh. Your flesh is anti-death. It wants to live and live and live and live and not die. Okay. And uh, going the extra mile, being diligent in what you do. You know, that's a, that's a mindset. And we have to try and get people coached out of this mindset of being mediocre. If you're going to really be exceptional for God, it's not going to happen by chance. It's going to happen by... Um, deliberate, purposeful, and intentional behavior. All right, let's let's dig into um, accountability a little bit more and and look at the partnership in the in the marriage relationship. And again, we are revisiting things. So if you've heard this before, just let it stir up your pure mind. First Peter three verse seven 
he's encouraging us. He says, likewise, hus ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Perhaps this time, because sometimes we quote the, the female verses and not the male verses. Um, let's get the verse before, which I didn't put up there. So First Peter 3. Okay, it starts off actually from chapter from uh, in chapter three from verse one. He says there likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. And a lot of instructions to wives there. I'm not going to go into it because we've done that before, and you can read that in your time. Then seven says likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, your wives, according to knowledge giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel and being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. Okay, so uh, there's a need for agreement and partnership in marriage. There's the, the wife has a job to do some submission and the husband has a role to dwell with the wife according to knowledge. That means that you need to understand uh, who your wife is. You need to have knowledge about your wife's likes and dislikes, your wife's um, behavior, your wife's shortcomings, because she probably will have shortcomings, just like the bride of Christ. The Bible says that Jesus gave himself in Ephesians for the church, that he might wash her and present her back to himself. And so if you're a husband and you, you've got, you can see uh, issues in your wife and weaknesses in your wife, that shouldn't surprise you because Christ asks you to love your wife as he loved the church. And the church is full of problems. You know it because you're in it. Okay, so there's problems, but how do we deal with them? Well, I've got to have some knowledge. This, this scripture assumes that the husband is actually a, the bigger person. It assumes that the husband um, is able to handle his wife carefully, giving honor to his wife. So as much as the wife should submit to you, the wife is someone that you should give honor to and give respect to the wife is not a football to be kicked around um, she's not someone to be bossed around you must be crazy your wife is someone that you should give honor to and you should do so as the weaker vessel and we touched this before the weaker vessel being being the fine china in your cabinet right this, the thing that's easier to break just because it's easier to break doesn't mean it's of less value Sometimes the things that are easiest to break cost you the most money. That's why you have to take good care of them. All right. So the Lord is saying, your husbands, you've got to, you've got to know who your wife is. You go, you can't treat your wife as if she's got your mother's grace. Your wife probably doesn't have your mother's grace. You can't treat your, your wife the way your father treated your mother. You need to have a bit more wisdom and knowledge in that to know your wife, her character, her nature. And you need to understand your role in bringing your wife into a, a place of perfection. I know a lot of wives who are leading the charge right now in their homes. They're the one that's calling the shots around prayer. They're the one that's calling the shots around the money and how it's spent. Now, I'm not telling you to um, not play to your strengths as a, as a couple. And, you know, sometimes there's, there's different strengths in the wives than there are in the husband. Um, but I think you need to understand that there are things that really should sit squarely with you in terms of decisions that need to be made. And I, I've learned this in life that if you let a man think that because you're better than him in a certain area, he's just going to let you do it. Not because he can't learn it, not because he can't get better at it, but because he's just lazy. You don't want to do it. And so I want to say to the husbands, you know, if you have a deficit in learning and understanding and knowledge in finance and accounting, you should work to know what you need to know because you're the head of that house. Don't, don't be lazy to learn new things. You can't come into the marriage in your early twenties and, and not know any more by the time you're 40. That's called abuse. You can't just put everything. If it's not fair, if the wife is the only one that knows when the children have homework and is the only one trying to pay the bills on time. That's not fair. You can't put all that on the, so what, in, in which sense are you the head? Is, 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 are you just the head because you get dinner on the table, hot and ready, when you walk in the door? What makes you the head if you take no control over anything in your house? What weight have you taken off of your wife? 
it's quiet. I must be speaking to somebody tonight. Amen, sir. Go ahead. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so, husbands, you, you got to have some knowledge. You, and you need to be fair-minded. You need to be fair-minded. You, you have to look at everything your wife is carrying and say, ma'am, is there, is there anything else I can carry? I'm not going to tell you how to run your house because the split in, in people's houses is very different. <laughs> some men don't cook. Some men do all the cooking. But it, within that relationship, they have an understanding. Some men don't know how to use the washing machine. And unless you have a maid, I don't think that's a good thing. Your wife gets sick and has to go into hospital and you don't know how to operate the machine. You don't know how to iron clothes and you can't even send your children to school with clothes press. Come on. There's some things you just, you should, it should be a partnership. Even if just for the case of an emergency, I'm not telling you how to split your 50-50 or your 60-40. That's down to you, but, but you must be considerate of your partner. And not just, you know, look at your partner like a donkey. How much more can I put on the partner? Can I put one more thing on her back? Let's see if she can still stand. Well, she will stand. She will. But there are so many women, unfortunately, who are waiting for their children to get old enough so they can just ditch that man who's done nothing for them their whole life. Don't be that man. My, my Lord. Yeah, get some wisdom. Get some understanding. I don't think it's an easy decision for a man and a woman to decide to go their separate ways. But be careful of that silent woman. When a woman stops talking, you're in trouble. It's better that she's talking. It's better that you have conversations that get heated occasionally than for you not to be speaking. Because that person who's not speaking is making plans. You don't want that to be you. So understand that this means, husbands, wives, that we're going to need to communicate. It means we're going to need to talk. It means we're going to have to use skills that maybe our parents didn't have. Not all of our parents are very verbal. Not all of our parents were, you know, would, would talk a lot about their issues. They would carry them silently. There was a, this old saying that, that men should be strong and silent. This was kind of people coming out of slavery. There's a reason for that because some of those folks, they saw way too much abuse. It was hard. They didn't get no therapy. And so they weren't very verbal. Some of us didn't have parents that picked us up and hugged us. You know, we can't, we can't be like that in this day and age, not with this generation. We better let our children know that they're loved. Okay, so let's get some knowledge. Read a book. Read a book. There's a book called The Five Love Languages. I, if you don't, if you can't, get, get the book in, in writing, get an audio book. Get it to be read to you. But you need to listen to this because this is telling us in this book, and it's done by Christian people, that we have different ways of expressing affection <clears throat> and we have different languages of love based on different things. I, I may have come from a house where, you know, loving my wife is making sure that the bills are always paid and there's food on the table. You know, my, my dad would always say, I never lost my pay packet. And that was his, you know, old school Jamaican uh, pride, right? That's, that's a good thing. I never lost my pay packet because that's what we were kind of raised to think. As long as I've paid the bills and I've made provision for stuff and food and everybody can be fed, I have done my job as a man. Well, this, the Bible, it takes it a bit further than that. You, you can't just give honor to the job. You have to give honor to your wife. And so some wives, they like to see the husband working. You know, poor man. If she's seen with his feet up, she's thinking lazy. Man always has to be doing something. Otherwise, he's a lazy man. Because maybe in her mind's eye, her dad was always doing stuff. And his way of telling them that they loved him was just the fact that he was always working. He was always fixing something. And you got a man who just type on computer like me. Don't want to put up a shelf. <laughs> oh, dear. You know, you want, you thought you were marrying your father. And so you're looking for a man who's going to do stuff for you. And you got other women who they couldn't care what you did in the house. They just want you to give them attention. I want when you come home, you look me in the eye, you talk to me, you give me a kiss, let me know that you recognize me. There's some woman whose heart break when you come in the house and the first thing you do is hug all the children and you barely look in her face. To feel like you don't love her because that's the way she looks for love. She looks for it in an embrace when you walk through the door. You need to find out who you married. 
It'd be good if you could know these things before you even uh, get into a full relationship through marriage counseling. I think that's where we need to be now as churches is helping people to understand these types of things before they get into a marriage. So I, I'm just using that according to knowledge and giving honor. And I'm just exploding that tonight to say that, that we need to make sure that we have agreement. We need to make sure that we are doing the things the Bible says that make for peace. You can keep trying to love your spouse the way your parent loved your other parent and you'll never get it right because you've not understood your spouse well enough. And you need to give them space to be themselves. You shouldn't try to make them like and love the way you love. You know, some people love to get presents and they love to get flowers occasionally. And some people think, well, flowers is a waste of time. When you bring in flowers here, they're gonna be dead in a few days. Yet some people love that. So you have to know who you married and make sure that you live, as the Bible says here in the last clause, as being ears together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. What that means is that you got to look at heaven as if it's a single reward for both of you. Don't think that, well, because I can't make peace with my wife, I'm just going to turn the other way and I'm going to make sure I make it to heaven. You know, I'm going to work out my own salvation with fear and trembling. That scripture doesn't apply to you in a marriage. This is the one that applies to you in a marriage. Working out your own salvation, you and your wife are one. So it includes your wife. The two become one flesh. You can't be working out your own salvation and your wife's going to hell. That scripture that the two shall be in the bed and the one shall be taken is not for you, man of God. It's not for you. You ought to live as if you're getting one prize in heaven. Go to bed as if, if, if she's not right, then you're both not right. Don't allow your son to go down on your raft. You got to imagine that it's one prize for the two of you. And it's not because it is that way, but it's saying this is the mindset you need to have if you're going to have a successful marriage. Because right. the minute you allow yourself to become individualistic in a marriage, it breaks down. It breaks down. Look for middle ground. Look for compromise. My wife doesn't eat everything that I eat. And, you know, and I don't eat everything that she eats, but it's not that I can't eat it. I just don't like it. What if I, if it's a case that I just don't want to eat it, then occasionally I can just eat that meal because it's her and me. Why should I make her make two different meals on a night when I could eat it, but I'm just being stubborn? Come on. Have some middle ground. Give up some, 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 some ground so you can have peace in your marriage. And the Bible says, if you don't live in this way, if you don't look after your wife in this way, your prayers are going to be held up. So if you don't want your prayers to be hindered, pay attention to your wife. When you was a single man, all you had to do was fast, pray, and come to church and take care of yourself. It's not the way it is now. You have more responsibilities. Your prayers can get stopped by mistreatment of your spouse. I believe this goes both ways, even though it's speaking to the husband. You mistreat your spouse. God says, I'm not listening to you. I mean, how can he? If in Matthew 5, he says that you should make it right with somebody who you think has an ought against you. And that's not your wife. That's external to your house. So how can you be trying to be at peace with everybody outside your house and you don't have peace in your house? You're a hypocrite. You're a hypocrite. True, sir. Amen. You have peace with all other people and you don't have peace at home. That's hypocrisy. And it's a false start. It's a false start for your ministry. If you think I'm going to just do what I want regardless of what my wife thinks, you have to find a way to get peace in your situation, in your home, because your prayers will be held up. Another verse from Apostle Paul um, in the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 7, 33, it says, but he that is married, careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Don't fool yourself. I don't care how saved your wife is. If you have a wife, you need to understand how the world works. You need to know what's on sale. And when it goes on sale <laughs> for your wife, you see that it says he cares for the things that are of the world. You're not just, it's not just a spiritual relationship. Someone has a question, sir. Okay, go ahead. Christina. Was Is that by mistake, Christina, or? It's so sorry, about sorry about that. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, so if you're married, your concern is not just for the church. So many houses were destroyed because the man just concerned 
of the church. You, you've planted many churches and you've done many things and your children hate you. It's not a good testimony. You didn't, you didn't care for your house. You didn't take care of your wife and the things that pertain to your wife and the children. And so it's, it's, it, it can't be a good testimony that you've done all these things for the, for the kingdom of God and your children are not interested in God. That's tragedy. Right. Um, my Lord. That, that, that would be like Noah getting the whole world to get on the ark and his children said no. Oh Lord, help us. That would be so disappointing. And so let's not over spiritualize marriage. When you're in your bed with your wife, I don't care what anybody tells you, it's not a spiritual occasion. It's not. It's flesh. The two shall become one flesh. Now you have to work on your spirit getting aligned flesh part is the easiest part it's so easy people people do it before they get married they can't resist the flesh part is not the problem it's the spirituality and if the enemy can allow you just to have a physical relationship you'd be happy with that there are some folks that are just okay i've got my man i've got my wife you know we have a holiday or two a year we go where we want to go. They don't have, there's nothing spiritual about their marriage, but they, they have a good life and they're comfortable. Mm. It's no use. I said to the church on Sunday where I was preaching that it doesn't matter how much stake you put in this flesh. It doesn't matter how many holidays you take it on. It doesn't matter how much plastic surgery you give it. You're just preparing it for maggots. Yeah, you're fattening your flesh for maggots. True. So, so how can I only have a natural plan for my life and I have no spiritual plan? Then your spirit right. becoming weak, anorexic, meager. You have not laid up treasures in heaven. You've, mm. you've stored them up on the earth. So you got nothing in heaven because all of your life was around the flesh. Doesn't matter how good your partner is in bed is how good they are on their knees you can get all of that in the world you can buy it if you want it flesh it's available amen as we've Hallelujah. come into christ we have to build spiritual relationship we have to understand our partner after the spirit if you're a husband and you can see your wife is struggling that means you are to get medicine from god to give your wife you're supposed to be medicine you're supposed to be help the bible says he gave his life for his wife, the church, that he might dress her, that he might make her a pure bride, a clean bride, that he might be able to present her acceptable to him without spot and without wrinkle. So don't be, don't be put off. How can you, how can you um, be telling your wife, you think, you think you're saved and you say you're saved. Oh my, imagine if God said to us and you say you're saved. <laughs> it would be demoralizing for us. If he didn't show us grace and mercy, every time we made mistakes and every time we tripped up, All right. we, we, would, we wouldn't be able to survive a kind of berating mm. of the father. If he, if he just, just was disappointed with us every time we did something wrong, we need that mercy to be new every morning. We wouldn't have made it this far. So how can we be more gracious to our spouse? How can we be more forgiving? Oh, I said that we should come and pray at seven o'clock and you didn't come till 10 past. I'm not going to pray now. Don't be stupid. Don't be ignorant. Don't be neighbor. Push your prayer to, to quarter past. Make it work. Find another time. Operate in grace and not misery. And don't Amen. listen. Some of, don't, don't sit up on your spouse if they call for prayer. You want to pray and there's one person praying. You sing a song and it's one person singing. Come on, lose that spirit. Participate. Lift right. up your voice. Amen. Sing as well. Sing a harmony. Yes. Do something. Don't sit in the room and be quiet and say, he says it's time to pray. Let's, let's see what I'm doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Come on. We're a partnership. He needs your help. She needs your help. Encourage one another. Be gentle. David said, your gentleness made me great. This was a man of war. He's a man of war. And, you know, he said, Lord, you teach my fingers to fight. You make my feet like hinds feet. But when he breaks it down, he says, your gentleness is what made me great. 
how you were gentle with me, how you were kind to me. That's, that's what's really made me the person I am because you didn't have to be gentle with me. Look at all the power and might that you have. You could have just kept commanding me to attention, but in tenderness, in loving kindness, you drew me. You showed me love, not just a war. A woman doesn't just need a warrior, right? She needs someone who's going to show love, care, and affection. All right, so he that is married cares for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. He's working out different places he can take his wife on vacation. Yeah, that's why Minister Reed isn't here tonight, and I endorse him not coming on. Take your wife away somewhere, sir. Take some time out. Spend some time with your spouse. It's necessary. Church is wonderful and being on all the watches is, ne is good, but you need time for your family. You need time for your wife and your children. Take that time. Don't let nobody make you feel guilty when you've given what God deserves, all right? So, so somebody them, what? Somebody has a question. Um, well, they send it privately, sir. Okay. Can you read it out? So what about the husband who always accusing the wife about wrong things and turn around talking about you are Christian? Well, so the question is, what about the husband who always accusing the wife about wrong things and turn around talking about you are Christian? Yeah, and I, and I, I, I touched on that already, right? But in, in this situation, both people just need to op operate in more grace. Right, you need right. to forgive the husband right. that said those things. Right, because it's it's one thing to say those things; it's another thing to not forgive him for saying those things. Because it becomes a sticking point. You're not letting that go. You have to you have to come to a point where you let it go. Sometimes our behavior has attracted um, rebukes that maybe in our wisdom we shouldn't have given, but they weren't wrong to say. It. Right? The Bible said the accuser of the brethren is cast down. If you do something that is an accusation worthy, you need to know you have a minister that is ready to come against you. Satan, he's the accuser of the brethren. That's why we need to try our best to live a blameless life. Right. Because he is designed and he is committed to accuse you. That's why I say, said, yeah, go on. The person said, I always do, but at times it's really hard. Yes, it is hard. It is hard. And welcome, welcome to the narrow way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what makes it difficult. It's not uh, easy. Yes. You know, we, we, all, we have to keep going back to the well of grace. We have to find that place of forgiveness. And also, we must repent too. Because when you repent of the behavior that the enemy accuses you of, his like, accusation don't mean nothing anymore. Yeah, you, you can't accuse me of something I ask for forgiveness for. And I've repented of, I, I talked about this on the prayer meeting this morning, that as much as we are to forget the things that are behind, if you have not repented of the things behind, they, you can't forget them because they're going to come back and the devil's going to find a way to bring it back to you. And I'm going to say it again, if you fell into fornication with your wife before you married her, you need to repent, and both of you. You need to, because it's an open door that the enemy's using and will use against you the spirit of lust. You need to make sure that the spirit of lust is not dominating your marriage till this day. And you don't want lust to turn around and say, you don't really love each other. It's just lust, you're lost each other. You need to conquer that spirit. You need to conquer it. So as well as forgiving people, we must also be introspective and self-reflective and hold up our hands and say, you know what, I was wrong. That wasn't Christian behavior. Now I'm being called out for not behaving like a Christian. I need to hold that rebuke and repent. I need to try my best to live a life that's not worthy of accusation. And when I do get accused, I need to repent. And Jesus said, if somebody was to um, hurt you, you know, and in, in every day, in, in one day, and he hurts you and he keeps coming back and saying, please forgive me, he said, you have to forgive him. You have to forgive him. Mm -hmm. 70 times 7 in one day, you have to forgive him. Is it easy? No, but it's the way that the, the Lord has laid down before us. And the way, the reason he does that is because he knows that heaven hangs upon our relationships. Heaven is, is dependent upon the way we relate to the people closest and nearest to us. And, the, and to the stranger, we're being judged. And so the Lord doesn't want any sin to be in us. Otherwise, we can't enter into heaven. 
So partnership and agreement in marriage is something we have to work on. It's something we have to endeavor for. You're going to face different challenges at different stages of the marriage. I, I don't have, I think I have one teenager now in my, in my marriage and a female. Now it's a new set of challenges. You know, you get in every phase, you're going to get new challenges. I've had older men tell me there's different challenges when you have to send them off to uni and when they come back and when they want to get married, it just it doesn't stop being challenging. But we have to be um, so much in partnership that we are facing it together and we're taking the weight of the home and its responsibilities. We're taking that together. Yes, play to your strengths. Play to your strengths, but don't be lazy. Okay. Let's be accountable in the marriage. If we're gonna set up a, a time to pray, then let's be accountable to each other and keep that. If we miss it, don't, don't be silent about it. Say it, man, we missed today, but let's make sure we come back in the evening. Let's make sure we make it work tomorrow morning. Or, you know, Wednesdays, my schedule is slightly different. Let's change the time. Be tenacious and stay in communication about it. Don't think that you just have your personal prayer times and that's gonna be it. You need to work together. The devil doesn't want you to work together because one can chase a thousand. He's okay. If you're just trying to defeat a thousand, he's okay with that because it's 10,000. He don't want to be, to be chased away. 10,000 we put to flight by the two of you being on one accord. You can have greater, bigger victories if you are in unity. Um, sir, um, if I might just um, put something to you that you might be able to expound on it, mm -hmm. you know, according to the grace of the Lord unto you. Um, I think in the same portion of scripture we are reading from in first corinthians when the apostle paul would have went on to say that let he that is married live as if he's not married you know can you you know speak to that regarding in the same context as you know he that is married live to please his wife or the, the wife live to please her husband okay let's turn there Let's turn there and let's put it in the, in the proper context. So 1 Corinthians 7, sorry, yes. 7 and that verse is verse 10. And um, so let's, let's go back a few verses. Um, he says from verse 7, so 1 Corinthians 7, verse 7. Right. I would that all men were even as myself, but every man has his proper gift of God. One after this manner and another after that. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it's good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. Oh, hang on a minute. Did I, did I go over your verse already? Um. I don't think so, sir. Hang on, um, hang on. As if he were not married, okay. Right. I'm trying to come across the verse. Let's try it again. Verse 29, sir. Verse 29, sir. I think up to verse 29 or 30. 28. 29, from probably about 28. But then if don't marry, that was not. Or 29 to about verse 30. All right. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had not none. <laughs> Okay, and it says, and they that weep as though, they, as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoice not, and that they buy as though they possess not, and that they use this world as not abusing it for the fashion, abusing it for the fashion of this world passeth away. Okay, um, but I would have you without carefulness, he that is unmarried, care for the things that belong to the Lord, how we may please the Lord, right? So he's, he's affirming here that the unmarried man, he's only caring about how he can please the Lord. 
Right. He that is married cares for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Uh, there's a difference also between a wife and a virgin. Okay. So he's, he's acknowledging, on the one hand, he's acknowledging that um, there is a difference between the married man and the unmarried man. There's a difference with, with, with um, his concern and what he has to look after. Further up, he's talking about the fact that, and he says time is short. And this is the way they preached the gospel back then, as if Jesus was coming tomorrow. And I don't fault him for that because you don't know the day and or the hour. Right. So he's, 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 he's appealing to them at the verse that you've mentioned up here in, in verse um, 29, in view of the time, I, I, I like the verse, I would liken this to the verse that says you need to make your calling and election sure, right? He's talking about making sure that you are ready to meet the Lord. Consider that the time is short. So even though the unmarried man is only concerned about pleasing the Lord, you must still make sure that you're ready. So in the sense that the unmarried man um, is only concerned about uh, pleasing the Lord, he is saying that you still have to make sure that your business is fixed and right with God. The essence of all of this, as you go down to the very end, I mean, he says, <laughs> he said by verse 39 and 40, he said, the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, She's at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord, but she is happier if she abide after my judgment. And I think that I also have the spirit of God. Interesting here. He's being very bold and he's saying, this is my judgment, but please pay attention to the fact that I have the spirit. Right. Even though this woman want to be married again, she'd be happier if she wasn't married. <laughs> Now, some people might disagree with that as a woman, but he's speaking from the point of view that when you get married, you're still going to have to wash clothes, cook and clean. I know so many married people would say, if my husband dead, we never do it again. Right? <laughs> and yet some folks would say, I don't know if I could live without a husband having had a husband for so many years. So he is giving his perspective on this, I think. I think it's, um, it, it can appear to be contradictory. I think we would probably need to read higher up in the, in the scriptures, but he's, he, I see both things here. He's saying that the man who's married is not like the man who's unmarried because he has a wife right. to take care of. You just, you can't ignore it, right? And so he's not advocating that you ignore your wife um, and be like the unmarried man. He's just True. saying you need to be as saved and as ready as the unmarried man despite the fact that you have a wife that you have to take care of additionally. That's the way I read that and see that. Okay. Cause that's, yes, it, it would, it, it would go against Ephesians and everything else that we see about um, submitting one to another. If it was a case that married people should live actually as if they weren't married, that, that can't be right. <laughs> right, sir. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Otherwise, what would marriage be? What would, what would, what would the worth of marriage be if you acted as if you weren't married? This is just in, in relation to your, your readiness and your, your pleasing. Right, you. right. I, I Make sure you sir. live right. a life pleasing to God, even though you're in a married situation. Amen. Okay. Hope, hope that helps. And we, we just took that Absolutely. one. It helps. Blessings. Okay. All right. So are we, are we ready to move on <laughs> from marriage? Amen. Any other questions or thoughts or comments? We'll take them before we go on. I know this is a hot topic all the time. All right, I'm going to take you, take the quietness as a chance to move forward. All right. Now, what I what I want to show here. Let me just see what else I have. Okay. Somebody said before you go on, sir. Somebody said yes, sir. That's the exact words I I told my husband at times. I tell him. That he's like an hundred man. <laughs> not sure. I'm not certain if that's the correct reading. Somebody said that's the exact words I told my husband. At times, I tell um, that he's like an hundred man. Not sure as to the thought that was being expressed. 
Uh, I, I can't say I understand it a hundred percent. I hope your husband understands it. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, you know, I I, oh, I would not marry um, again. Oh, the thought was I told him a hundred okay. times that I would not marry again. That thought. Oh right. I yeah. <laughs> I was I was getting fearful of um it was Elkanah that said to his wife, Am I not more to you than ten sons? I was getting worried there for a moment. Just a moment. My my baby's just come in the room and I'm alone at the moment with her. One second. Bless you. Sorry about that. Okay. So still in accountability and I'm getting the feeling I'm not going to get out of this lesson tonight. Um, I touched on this in the beginning about the church and how much um, support is needed and how much, you know, we just might not be the main man or the main person. We, we might just have a background role, but one that is so crucial. And I, I wanted to just look at accountability in ministry and just, uh, you know, Paul has been a subject of study for me quite a lot this year. And um, I really enjoyed listening to his comments about his fellow brethren. And I just went through all of the epistles in the book of Acts and just listened to how he talked about his brethren. Because most of us and most, you know, Paul is still the, the one that most of us talk about. Um, he is still causing contention and controversy um, around the world with his, his letters. Um, and so we all talk about Paul, but what about all the people that worked with Paul? And so I looked at these different areas where we need to be in partnership. And I want to encourage us. You know, the church is um, the body of Christ. Paul in another place speaks about the body as, you know, all the joints being connected and joints needing to supply. He's very careful to let us know, you know, that one part of the body can't boast against the other part. And sometimes I feel that we, we, we even in our, um, our zeal to be apostolic, I think we even miss other parts of the body of Christ. I think we miss things. Because we're not, we're not just, we're not judging after the spirit. We're judging after doctrine, right? And 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 people come to the knowledge of doctrine at different speeds and different paces. And so, the body of Christ is is a very vast um, entity in the earth, and it isn't it isn't everything that we think it to be. And the Lord has proven that to me just by bumping into people in different places um, who are Christians who didn't believe what I believed, and yet I felt the witness of their salvation. It was one of the most confusing things for me because I've been raised a staunch apostolic. And how come I felt God's presence? And how come I felt that this person was a child of God? What does it mean? How can a person be delivered and then not be apostolic? You know, sometimes the way that we have been trained in the word has been so brutal that we miss things without the, you know, if the spirit doesn't lead us into certain knowledge and understanding, we'll never get it because our religion is too strong. I may have hurt some people tonight, and I'm a believer in doctrine. Don't get me wrong. But when you when you buck up on somebody who's saved and they don't they don't sound like you or look like you, and you can know that they're delivered, it makes you have to ask God some questions. Anyhow, I'm not going to touch that too much. But here's the different areas that we need partnership in. And I put partnership in prayer. Paul had partners in prayer. He had partners in the labor and the missions, and he had what I call dependable role players people who played different roles in the ministry. He had partners in communication. He had people who would take letters from the prison to the churches and take things from the churches to him in prison to minister to him. Specifically, Philippi was very known for this. He had partners in intellect, in professions and work. He, he asked at one point for a lawyer to come down and meet with him, who was a brother. He had Luke with him, who was a beloved physician. Um, he had partners in house ministries. You see him sending greetings to the people who, who run the church in the house. Um, you see him having partners in affliction and in bonds. He has people who are arrested with him at times, beaten with him at times. Um, he has partners even in failures. You see some of the failures, and I'll touch on some of them. And then partners for what I call social intercession. Onesimus had a need 
and he needed someone to intercede with him, for him um, for his status in his master's house. So Paul, he had this rich company of, of partners in the gospel. And I want you to know that somebody somewhere needs you as a partner in the body of Christ. There, there is definitely something for you to do and something that you can contribute to. And I, and I, I just think about, you know, if, if things were going to be written up about the day that we lived in, you know, would we get an honorable mention? Yes, there's the, you know, the, the book of Hebrews 11, which we, we use mostly for honorable mentions of, you know, heroes of the faith. But, you know, when I strip down all the people that were in the life of Paul, I mean, there's just so many people and we read over them so quickly. But, you know, I want us to see, you know, that could be me. That really could be me. I, I might never be the guy writing the epistle. You know, I might never be, but I might be the one who's carrying it. I might never be the person who's got the great testimonies, but I'm there in the background and that's enough. You know, it's only pride that would want me to have another position just for the sake of it. Surely our desire should be that I just want to be part of God's business and whatever part he gives me in this great kingdom, I'll be happy to play a role. And I give God thanks for you. Those of you who are on, those of you who are on the prayer, because I think you don't have to be in prayer. You don't have to come out. You know, you don't have to be on a Bible study. Um, but you're here, and I believe that makes you a partner of what God is doing in the earth. And I'm, I'm just privileged to be able to serve in this way and find out the body of Christ. And I put here, now maybe it's on my, my next um, slide, but, you know, this is what the church had looked like before we had organizations. You travel to a place, you meet a brother, you meet a sister, you stay in touch. You Amen. travel to a place, you plant a church, you gain some brothers, you gain some sisters, you try to stay in touch. That's what you see in the life of Paul and the Acts of the Apostles. You know, oh, what's your organization? You know, come on. So we, we, we're in a place now where so many things divide us that we can't even feel after the, in the spirit sometimes the way we ought to because we're just so, we're so programmed to go by organizational boundaries and, and, and manuals and playbooks. Oh, Lord, help us. But he had partners in prayer. And I love this. And I want us to, maybe, Brother Heron, you can just help me turn to some of these scriptures. We won't read all of them necessarily, but I, I want you to get the spirit of Paul. You know, people like to just put Paul across as this dominant guy who don't believe in women preaching, thinks women should stay silent. You know, they, they, they want to lambast him with all of these um, accusations as if he was out of touch and it was just his opinion as if he wasn't spirit filled in his epistles you see in Romans 1 verse 9 um, these are just where Paul is saying I'm praying for you Romans 1 verse 9 do you have that one yes sir for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. Amen. So, Paul, I mean, he, he even goes as far as saying that he couldn't wait to go to Rome because he wanted to impart some spiritual gift. You know, the, the church wasn't just some kind of tourism. You know, it wasn't just some, just some adventure. Um, for Paul, and, and sorry, sir, that scripture in Ephesians is meant to be 16, 1 verse 16. Amen. Paul carried a burden for the church. Yes. He couldn't wait to get there because he wanted to deposit something and leave it behind. When he says, oh, you've got many instructors, but not many fathers, oh, he was talking about his role as an apostle. That he, he understood that he was there to be a father to these works. He was there to be a father to people. He couldn't wait to get there to give them the stuff that they would need. He goes to, I believe it's um, Troas, and you know, he, he, he journeys there with about five other missionaries with him. And he's, he's just so intent on giving the word. He's teaching all the way into the night, deep into the night, and a man falls out the window. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he had a sense that, look, I, I don't have forever to be with you. I'm going to give you what I can give you while I'm here. The man was a true servant of God. He says, I'm praying for you. I want to come and impart some spiritual gift among you. Ephesians 1, 16, sir. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. 
Okay, so to the church at Ephesus, he says, I, I'm, I don't cease to pray for you. I'm always praying for you. And when, yeah. when Paul lists all of the afflictions that he has to go through, I think maybe in Corinthians, he, he, he lists there, you know, that he carries the weight of the church. You know, it's something he loses sleep over. The church means so, so much to him. And so he was definitely praying for the church. And all of those other verses are going to tell you that he's praying for the church in, in Colossae. In Thessalonians, he's praying for the Thessalonian church. He's praying, he's praying. But then he says, but I want you to pray for me. Okay. I want you to pray for me. Now read, read some of these ones for me, sir. Uh, Romans 15, verse 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of of the spirit that he strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Strive together with me. That's yes. he's asking he's asking them to work with him in prayer. Yes. Now this isn't a oh Lord just remember minister read. It's more than that. And then move on. There's a there's a kind <laughs> of prayer that's a striving prayer Amen. where you get into the spiritual environment of the man of God that you're praying for. Right. And the spirit begins to help you to, mm. you know, pray that God will give him utterance to speak God's word boldly. Pray that God will give the man unity in his home between him and his wife. Um, help him with his business. I'm talking about our minister reading. I'm just talking about how I would pray for him, striving for him, battling against every force that has right. been assigned against his life and ministry. Amen. Remember Paul saying that we would have come to you, but the enemy you know, buffeted us, he withstood us, he, he blocked the way. So we want to pray for the, God's men, that God would open up the way, that we come up against every demonic sabotage against the life of ministers. When we say there's so much to pray for, I mean it. There is so much to pray for. Yes, amen. There's a way to pray for your man of God. There's a way to pray for the pastor in your life. You have to get in his business in prayer. Ask God to provide for him, to open doors that no man can shut and shut doors that no man can open. Strive for me. Strive, strive, work hard. Mm. You don't know what to pray for. Bring the man of God before the Lord. Sometimes we think that they've just, they're okay because they, they can rebuke. No, Paul was always saying, I want your prayers. Please pray for me. First Thessalonians 5 verse 23 um, I like that one. I think it's very short, but just to the point. First Thessalonians 5.23 And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right. I may have, I may have given you the wrong one. Let me try that. Again. First Thessalonians 5. Ah, it was 25. <laughs> Verse 25. Brethren, pray for us. Amen. Simple. One of the, one of the <laughs> shortest versions of ver verses. Amen. Brethren, pray for us. A man is always asking for prayer. This, this wasn't an arrogant man. He understood that his ministry and its success was dependent upon the prayer of the saints. Now maybe you can't go on that next mission. Maybe you're never going to be on a mission, but guess what? You can very much be on that mission in prayer. Man. One thing I respect about the church that I was raised in, whenever any of our missionaries would go on mission, we would not cease to pray for them. And up to this day, even though I'm not in my home church, if I'm doing a mission, I know they will set up prayer 24 hours a day and have a chain and they'll have a chain fast for every day that i'm out on mission that's how the church needs to operate right paul just wasn't a great man and a great minister the man was backed up by prayer mm. everywhere he went he begged the people to pray for him and he had praying men with him go to colossians 4 verse 12 Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. 
that he may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. I love this. He calls mm -hmm. out the brother and tells the church, this man is right. praying for you fervently. Mm -hmm. You know, I know you, you're just expecting a letter from me, but let me call out this brother because he's one of the reasons why you're having victory in that church. He is praying fervently for you. And these are the things that he's praying about. Saints, there is a role in prayer for you and me that affects the perfection of the church. Don't look down upon it. Amen. Some people don't pray because they don't really recognize that this is a calling of itself. It's uh, no shame if somebody says, well, what's your ministry? I'm an intercessor. Amen. I'm a prayer warrior. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't make you any less... The preachers need intercessors. Amen. Paul wouldn't ask for prayer so much if intercessory prayer was not necessary and important for the success of his ministry. Don't let nobody tell you you have no place in the house of God. Being upon the stage is not the most important thing. Being heard on a Sunday morning is not the most important thing. I need the prayers of people behind me before I stand before God's people. I depend mm. on those prayers. I rely on those prayers. They take it not for granted. Amen. So I love the fact that he's called out his brother Epaphras and said, man, you need to, you need to know that this man is in your corner. This man is really praying deeply for you. Um, I like the verse in, I think, Colossians 4, 2 to 3, just to, to show that he's specifically praying for help with his speaking and preaching. Colossians 4, verse 2 to 3. Masters. Give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Continue in your prayer, continue in prayer, and watch in the same with thanksgiving. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. So he's He's praying there for utterance to be given, to speak the word of God. You would right. think, well, Paul is an eloquent man. And you remember, he says he knows all these languages. <laughs> and he's learned all these things. And he's set at the feet of Gamaliel. He did not depend on his education to get the word right. out. He said, I need you to pray that when I speak, that God is speaking, that he's opening doors for me to speak because information isn't it. Information alone doesn't save people. Otherwise, people would be saved all over the world. The Bible is the number one selling book. If it was just like that, the people can't hear without a preacher. And the preacher can't preach unless God sends him. Amen. So Paul says, pray that doors of utterance will be open for me. Just, just do one more um, from the section of pray for others. 1 Timothy 2, uh, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Read that again, sir. It's very detailed and necessary. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. This is wonderful. He's, he's broken down prayer right. into, into four different areas. You know, right. supplications. That's, that's the real, the begging, begging, begging prayer. Yes. Amen. Prayers. You can just see that as ordinary prayer, but an intercession. Mm -hmm. That's standing in the gap for other people and giving of thanks. So when you all see the way I do prayer meeting, I didn't just make it up. All right. these things are necessary. We see them. We learn them from the apostles. That we come in, we come, we give thanks. We intercede for others. And he says we do it for all men. Mm. All right? So if you have nothing to do, I don't know how you have nothing to do. When intercession, supplication, and prayer, and giving of thanks needs to be made for all men. <laughs> he goes My on Lord. to say there, for kings and all that are in authority. That we may lead right. a quiet and peaceable life in all goodliness, godliness and honesty. Right? So when he's saying all men, he's, he means all men. 
unsaved men, men in position, poor men, rich men, all men. We can be busy praying. We can be busy. This is work, church. This, this, this is not separate from the work. This is the work. Yes. And it's all yeah. over. And I, I want you to be encouraged that, you know, yes. you're needed on your knees. You're needed. The kingdom of God needs you on your knees. Your church needs you on your knees. Some Man. of us have spoke more against our leaders than we have prayed for them. We've it. talked more about people than we have prayed for them. You are needed on your knees. Mm. People in your area, they need you. Sometimes we have concluded that people can't be saved. We've right. concluded that some people are too tough, that some areas can't be penetrated, that certain people would never come. We've stopped praying for all men. We start praying according to the type of people that got saved last time. Because we think, sir, you know, this is, this is how it goes when we go fishing. If we find that we get a good catch in a certain place, we go back there to catch again. But sometimes if you change your tools and if you change your spot, you can catch something bigger. Mm -hmm. You can catch a different kind of fish. He says, follow me and I'll teach you how to catch men. Prayer Good. is needed. Pray for others. Pray, pray, pray. And so we see all these different types of prayer. Acts 12, verse 5, the church prays for Peter while he's in prison. They pray without ceasing. They pray through the night. And an angel comes down and kicks the prison door open. Peter needed partners in prayer. Peter was in bonds. Paul and Silas, they didn't wait for the church to pray. When midnight came, the Bible says they began to sing and to praise. And the prison door opened for them, but they were together. Two, two of you, two of you can chase 10,000, put 10,000 to flight. The unity is needed. Saints, we need partnership in prayer. I love what we're doing because I, I believe that what we're doing means that we're in the word. Right. I don't have to be in your church building. I don't even have to be part of your organization to pray with you because men ought always to pray. And when we pray in partnership, we have great, great help. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over these now because it, they're just references to prayer. It was just to show you some of the prayers and some of the mentions. I want to bring out now a bit more about <clears throat> some of the people. Some of the people that are mentioned in Paul's writings and in Luke's writings. Um, you see, we start at the top here. We have, we have um, it's pronounced... Tukikos, Tukikos. Mm -hmm. I used to call it Tikias, all right? Um, his role, Paul calls him a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and he's one of those that communicates to the churches for Paul. He's a guy that's just taking letters. He's, you know, he, he'll say sometimes, I send this by the hand of so-and-so, and I send this by the hand of so-and-so. Imagine um, that a letter would not have been delivered without somebody there to take it. Yes, we had a man to write it, but we needed someone to carry it from one location to the next. Thank God for this brother. He's mentioned in Acts, in Ephesians, in, in Colossians, in Timothy, in Titus. He's seen in a few places. And then we have Trophimus. And I looked at some of their names because I'm, names, I'm just interested to see if their names had any meaning um, that might be impactful on their character to see the kind of people that was around the man of God. Um, this one would say he's, he is fortunate um, or faithful. And some of us, we don't believe in luck, um, but he, he was probably given name by, by people that wasn't saved. Nevertheless, he was definitely blessed to be in the company of the apostle Paul. Then we had Trophimus, whose name meant nutritious. It made me think, you know, you as a man of God, you want people around you who are gonna be good for your health. Um, there's a saying that says you are what you eat. All right. And whoever you sit with and whoever you hang around with, you're fellowshipping with, you're feeding with. I'm not talking about the normal food. I'm talking about the type of conversation that we have. Some people's conversation are not nutritious. Some people's words are not healthy for us. Um, but anyway, that was his name. Uh, he accompanies Paul on, I think, the third journey. And this I found interesting. Turn to 2 Timothy 4, verse 20. Um, he stayed back in a place called Miletum um, when on the missionary journey with Paul. 
2 Timothy 4.20. Amen. Eratos abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Militum 6. Now, maybe we thought that whoever Paul came into contact with got healing. Mm, true. <laughs> but here, Paul has to leave this man behind because he's sick. Mm -hmm. I mean, that adds a bit of context, right? Because, you know, I, I, I've heard folks say this all the time. We need to get back to life in the book of Acts where there was a miracle every day. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to tell folks, the book of Acts was a summary, my friend. <laughs> it's a summary. You didn't see what happened every day. In the, <laughs> you, go ahead, so go ahead. You got the best bits. Right. Condensed into a very, you know, few chapters to help you get to understand what was happening and the great things that God has done. <laughs> but I am glad for this verse. Right. I needed this verse. Amen. That Paul had to leave a guy behind who was sick. And we see Paul healing in other places. Some folks yeah. don't get better. <laughs> True. We pray for some people and they don't get healed. I'm sure Paul prayed for him. The same I Paul who said, I prayed three times for God to take something from me and he didn't take it. <laughs> At least he was able to tell us. I had to leave him behind. He wasn't well. Mm. So sometimes bad things can happen to folks and we're not going to get into whether he should have been on the journey we don't know if he should have been on the journey thank god he was on the journey i'm sure he was useful while he was there so just an interesting point to look at there so trophimus was, was sick but he was there with paul and look at all these people he calls out i've got another slide full of, of names of people that he calls out okay uh Sopeta of berea remember we talk about um the bereans a lot we talk about the bereans as being the people who um they went over the word of God after it was preached to them. Um, so we had a brother from Berea. And what, what I noticed, um, Acts 20 verse 4 is really talking about, I think, the third missionary journey. So these, these missionary journeys are growing and growing. And what Paul is doing is he's bringing people along for the journey who are going to understand what it is to do missions and learn what it is you know, to preach on the road, if you like. Um, so he's taken people under his wings from the places where the churches were planted. So Trophimus um, was from Ephesus and uh, Sopater from, um, I believe, uh, from, from Berea. And then you have Aristarchus next from um, Thessalonic, Thessal Thessalonica or from the Thessalonian church. So he's, he's collecting brethren that can learn from him and he can send them back. It's a, it's a wonderful um, model for how to, to grow people. Um, let's have a look. We have Gaius, and this guy is, there's actually probably four different Gaiuses in total, one mentioned by the Apostle John, but three different ones mentioned by um, the Apostle Paul. Nevertheless, he gets honorable mentions. Uh, he was one that was caught up in the uprising at Ephesus, as was Aristarchus. Um, they got caught up in that crowd that was going on crazy about Diana. Uh, he was one of them. Then there was another one who was on the last journey with Paul. Then you have another one who, who hosts Paul in his second stop at Corinth. Um, and he, he praises him for the hospitality. And you see the, the name means Lord. So most of these men, uh, like their name, had a position of a high position, were able to entertain um, Paul, especially in Corinth. Then we have Mark. We know Mark or Marcus. His name means a defense. And um, we know that he's a, defended the gospel. He has his own gospel written. He was a, a, a cousin of Barnabas. And we're going to come down to Barnabas in a little bit and talk a little bit about him before we close off tonight. Um, yes, and we'll bring up Mark again when we talk about Barnabas because there was conflict over him. Luke, we also know he wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts. He's called the beloved physician. He's the last man with Paul. Uh, when he writes Timothy, he says, only, only, only Luke is left with me. And so we, we understand that Luke travels with Paul. And that's why we have in the book of Acts an extended writing upon um, the life of Paul and the missionary journeys, because Luke was one of those who traveled with him extensively. Onesimus, we see in the book of Philemon, 
his name means profitable or useful, which is interesting because Paul uses those terms when he's writing his former master, that he has been profitable to me and I'm sure that he will be to you if you let him come back home. And this is where Paul makes his social intervention. Onesimus is a man who's run away from his master's home, but he gets salvation while he's on the road. And so because legally he's owned, and this is not like um, a slavery, uh, post-Atlantic uh, tr uh, slave trade. Um, it's, it's not like that. There was this, this was legal slavery where, you know, the man was, was legally bought for a while. And even though he could, finish up his time he left before his time was finished up and so Paul writes a letter for him and intercedes for him so this is some of the brethren of Paul you begin to see some of his pastoral work here we have Aphroditus and his name means lovely he also delivered epistles for Paul and ministered to Paul's wants he would bring packages and you'll read uh, Philippians and you'll see where Paul is you know, you have these little footnotes where he's saying, you know, thank you for the stuff you sent me. I really appreciated receiving that. So he's a man who's just, um, you know, number one, carrying epistles, but also bringing packages of support <coughs> for people in prison. I believe there's a project called, I think, the Epaphroditus Project, um, which is people sending things for people in prison who have no one to send them stuff. So, you know, we can be inspired by these different people and their names. But he played an important role. Um, you, you can feel so much of the, the joy of Paul in writing the book of Philippians, even though he's in prison. He's so enamored with this, so in love with this church because of how good they have been to him. And this is the man who was the foot soldier. <clears throat> There's also an Epaphras as well. And it's believed that they're two different people will come to him later. We pass over it. Silas is possibly also Silvanus. And so we know he's... He's Paul's missionary partner, um, joins him with Barnabas before Barnabas drops off. And he's a, a laborer with him in Antioch. And also you'll see in the writings of Timothy that Paul moves on, but Silas is left behind. So Paul is also um, mentoring Timothy through Silas as well. Silas is there supporting the church when, when Paul moves on to new places. So this is a network of people. Um, who are supporting the, the, the gospel in one way or the other. Now, I brought up Barnabas and Demas here on the, as the last one on this slide because there are two people mentioned in several places or at least a, a few places in Demas's case who ends up leaving or backsliding. And then we have Barnabas who also seems to move away uh, from working with Paul. And I want to touch that a little bit. Maybe I'll start with Demas because he's mentioned in a few places, not specifically as, you know, he's just mentioned as sending greetings because he's with Paul. He's on the missionary journey with him. He never praises him greatly of anything. Um, but when we get to the place where he leaves him, he says, I think in 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, uh, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world and has departed to Thess Thessalonica and and Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. So he speaks about Demas as forsaken him, and he speaks about him uh, loving the present world. Then he mentions a few other people whose names um, are on the other slide, at least one of them are. Three other people, or two other people who left him as well. It didn't say that they followed this world, but they were no longer with him. Now, Barnabas is an interesting one, son of consolation. Another version says son of prophecy um, is what his name means. He is the one that presents Paul to the church. When the church were frightened of Paul because they knew him as the Saul, who's the church persecutor, this man was very instrumental in bringing Paul to the people and saying, look, this man is really saved. God is really on his life. Listen to what he has to say. Barnabas goes off with Paul and he's doing work with him. And he's come back and says, I need you to understand we're seeing the hand of God. There are miracles taking place. He is the real thing. And I'm working together with him. Then we get to the place in the book of Acts chapter 13, where the spirit of God separates Paul and Barnabas for the work of the ministry. Paul doesn't go out on his own. Paul was hardly ever on his own. He always had somebody with him or somebody praying for him. And then we get to this point, and I find this interesting. Barnabas says, we should really bring Mark with us. And um, Paul says no. And they got into a dispute over whether 
you know, uh, Mark should be on the trip with them or not. And they, they split up over this issue. And so we only see now Paul and Silas continuing. But later on, Paul writes back and he says, well, tell Mark to come. I want Mark to join me because, you know, I have, I have a use for him. He's useful to me. Um, that's, again, 2 Timothy 4, verse 11. At this point, he says, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Now, you could say, oh, maybe Barnabas was right all along. Because sometimes we just say, well, you know, Barnabas was the bad guy because we don't hear about him anymore. And um, some say there's a book written by him out there, but other people say that can't be attested to be verifiably be uh, Barnabas. Um, genuinely, his, his writing. So was he right or wrong? Why, why did they disagree on that? Well, who knows? But again, I'm glad that we see ministers falling out because it happens. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily that one of them isn't saved just because you've got more of his books. Um, you can see from here that there's some vindication for Barnabas. However, by the time we get to Galatians, Paul is speaking about the role of Barnabas. Um, he says, it was at Galatians chapter 2, verse 13, where Paul goes down to see Peter. And he's talking about rebuking him openly because of how they were treating Gentile people. And so there's a suggestion here in verse 13. Um, it says, the other Jews dissembled likewise with him in so much that Barnabas was also carried away with their dissimulation. And this dissimulation is talking about hypocrisy. It's talking about them being hypocrites that they say that they um, were Christian, but they were treating the Gentiles like second-class citizens. So he's saying, um, he's suggesting here that Barnabas was actually carried away with um, Judaizers, if you like, people who, who didn't really believe um, that Gentiles could, uh, should be uh, Christians just by faith, that they should actually have to go the whole way. They would need to circumcise. Yeah, if he was around today, by this account, he would be a Hebrew Israelite. Okay, so this is the suggestion that, that Barnabas went up in that direction. But I bring it up to say that in the walk that we have, we will work with people who are with us today and are not with us tomorrow. We need to be mature about how we deal with people that go in one direction or the other. We also need to be as fair as possible you know, and, and not try to write people off just because they went in a different direction. Conflicts arise and arose in the early church and they will arise in our time as well. But we want to make sure that we continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine comes what may. I have another table here not completely filled out, um, but just a whole load of other names of people that Paul calls out, Nymphus who had a church um, in her house. And I say her because the scholars of late have said that that's, was a woman that was being referred to, even though it says his, you can debate that with scholars. But there was a church in the home and Paul in Colossians is calling out the church. And in fact, I like Colossians 7. If you turn, if everybody can turn to Colossians 4 from verse 7 to 18, you will see a lot of mentions in there of a lot of these names of brethren, um, people who are brushed over, not talked about, um, you know, not, they're not, nobody makes anything about them, but I want to give them their place tonight and remind you that you also have a place. He says, all my state shall Tychius declare unto you who is a beloved brother. Okay, so he has a man who's just a messenger who's going to help him communicate. I'm going through that list above that I had earlier on. He says, and he's a faithful minister and a fellow servant, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that you that he might know your estate. So I'm sending someone down there to find out how you're doing, to find out how you're doing. I'm sending someone to be my eyes and ears. You might be able to be the eyes and ears in the ministry in some way or other. He said, um, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. They're going to make sure that you understand how we're operating in the church. 
that we're doing it on one accord. Aristarchus, he says in verse 10, my fellow prisoner. So he's been in prison with, prison with this guy. He salutes you. And Marcus, that's Mark, sister's son to Barnabas. I said they were cousins. Touching whom you receive commandments. If he come unto you, receive him. So he's making way for other brethren. And he says, and Jesus, which is also called Justice, another name, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort to me. The man of God needs comfort. The man of God needs people to talk to, him, people to work with, people who are going to labor with him and go down in the trenches. You know, we don't just want to send people. There are some that have to go with those that go, and some who have to pray for those who go. Then he says, Epaphras, uh, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, salutes you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. We touched it earlier on, that ye may stand perfect and complete in the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you, and of them that are in Laodicea, and them in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, this is the roll call on and out, and Demas greet you. That time Demas was still with him. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphas and the church which is at his, in his house, according to King James. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. And likewise, read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, another name drop, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. Praise God. I Amen. wanted to just bring you tonight into the spirit of the missions and the spirit of the servant of God and how important all these different names are. All these different people are in, in his life and in his ministry. You have a part to play. You have a part to play in the kingdom of God. And so as, as we go forward, don't think that there's any one of us who can operate independently. This is all coming back to accountability. Don't think there's any one of us who can do this without other brethren. There are people in the background that you've never heard of that we depend on greatly praying for us. There are people that, you know, men of God need to be able to go to when they're having trouble. A man of God can't necessarily put all his troubles out online and say, I'm having these problems. He needs other mature men of God in his life that he can call upon and say, I need your help in this situation. He has to remain accountable. And all of these names just speak to a degree of accountability. I like the fact that he drops a little word in. I don't know who Archippus is or whatever he became, but he encouraged him. You know, imagine you getting a mention from the Apostle Paul. Say to him, take heed to the ministry that you received. You, man, you've got something in you. Listen to that which God has given you. Trust what God has invested in you. This man is always encouraging other people and helping them to stand up and rise up. I'm, I'm, I'm towards the middle of where we want to be. And so I'm going to just stop on this slide um, because we're not going to have the time. But I wanted you to come away tonight, if with nothing else, to know that you are valuable and you have a part to play. Someone's ministry and life is depending upon the effort that you make in prayer. And it's not, it's not lost. The Bible says what you're doing when you pray is you're laying up treasures in heaven. That's what you're doing. Yet nobody knows that you're doing it all the time. This time, yes, we advertise a bit of prayer. But when you seek God privately, he says he's going to reward you openly. God is keeping a record. Don't let nobody tell you you don't have a ministry. You don't have no part to play. Get on your knees. Pray for the man of God. Pray for the people of God. Be honest with somebody about the needs you have and ask them to pray with you. Be specific about what you're trying to fix in your life and, and come back to them and say, it's not fixed yet. I still need some more prayer. Will you fast with me? Will you come with me? Don't let things go. Be accountable. And I believe accountability is going to help us, many of us, get through into a season of spiritual stability and consistency in the things of God. I think I'm going to just stop here tonight. I'm going to stop here. And um, if the Lord allows, we'll come back next week and we'll just finish up on the final two principles. The two principles we touched tonight was accountability within our marital home and within our, home, within our homes and accountability 
to the wider church. If you're not coming to church, somebody should know you're not going to be there. It's called good accountability. Yeah. If you can't make an event that the church is putting on and it's for everyone and the pastor says everybody should be here. If you're one of those people that just don't even bother to turn up and don't even say you can't make it, you're not accountable enough. You need to be accountable. Accountability is going to help you to be the right kind of Christian. I want the whole church to be on fasting, says pastor. You just don't intend to do it and you're not going to do it. Not good for your spiritual life not good for your spiritual discipline. If you can't obey the people who you can see, how are you going to obey the people who you can't see? Paul says it again, that you should, you should give respect to those higher powers. Fall in line. The ministers of God are giving to you, uh, not for a terror to good works, but a terror to evil works. They're there to help you to be good and to do the right thing. Okay, so I'm not going to go into this slide tonight. I'm just going to conclude here. And just ask us that we, we, we be very careful to make plans and to share them. If you have a need, you have a fault, even as James said, share that fault. Confess your faults one to another. Don't hide them and don't bury them. Everything you can confess, you can be delivered from. God bless you tonight. I'm going to ask um, Minister, is it Heron that's been helping me tonight? Is that you, sir, Minister Heron? You sound yes, so much sir. like Minister Rowan. I can't tell sometimes. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, well, my voice somewhat is distorted. You know, um, of late, it has not yet recovered to its strength. But trust in God to restore it. So surely, okay. let that be. Let that be on the prayer prayer request tonight. <laughs> Bless you. Do you mind just wrapping up for us tonight? Just praying. If you have anything to to share in conclusion, please do, sir. Before I would even go to say anything, I just want for us to just where we are in our homes to just lift our hands and just worship God and thank him for his word. Hallelujah. We could thank you, just Jesus. all come off the mic and just give him thanks for his word. God bless you. The word of God is true. It's quick. Hallelujah. It's powerful. Hallelujah. 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 Word of life. Oh, my Lord. Thank you for your word. Hallelujah. Thank you for your servant, 